Now I'd like to recognize Nick Rowe, President of Kentucky American Water, for presenting sponsor remarks. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it, my friend. Good afternoon, and, and uh, on behalf of our entire team of central workers at uh, Kentucky American Water, I want to welcome you to today's luncheon. We really look forward to hearing uh, from our governor, Andy Bashir. You know, we at Kentucky American are really pleased to continue our support of the public policy series. Thank you, Raymond uh, Daniels and Bob Quick and Andy Johnson and all the staff at Commerce Lexington for trying to find a way uh, to continue these uh, uh, sessions during these challenging pandemic times. And thanks for all the sponsors that you saw listed there that continue to partner with us to make sure we support Commerce Lexington. You know, we're a water uh, service provider for a lot of people on this call, we remain uh, solely focused on the safety of our employees and uh, our customers and our community as we work through this, trying to provide service. Uh, we got employees like so many businesses on the call here working from home, but we have our essential employees that are out in the field uh, practicing uh, social distancing, wearing masks, and modification of workspaces in the office. So we're doing all the things that everybody's doing trying to get through this pandemic. For our customers, we continue to offer different payment options and have recently installed a new kiosk to drive by at the office down on Richmond Road where people can drive by and make uh, uh, payments uh, without getting out of the vehicle. Uh, also during this time, our H2O to others program sponsored by our company through our shareholders dollars continue to provide uh, in, uh, help for low income families. And at the same time, we're working with the Community Action Council getting out the word on Governor Bashir's health at work, uh, health at home utility relief fund. So we work with Sharon Price and the folks over at Community Action trying to keep the word out, just trying to help our low income folks get through this. We pledge to continue to do our part in community like so many businesses have done. Uh, Governor, as he speaks today, I'd like to thank him for his continued leadership during a really tough time in our Commonwealth. And, as past chair of the state chamber, I also want to thank the governor and his staff for how closely he worked with us during this, during this year, uh, trying to secure PPE and working closely with Ashley Watts, our president and CEO of the state chamber, and really trying to take our calls and try to help find a way to get businesses back to work. Uh, we don't get to please everybody, uh, but I tell you, the, the governor's office always took our call and try to find a way to get to some solution. So I want to, I'm looking forward to hearing from the governor today and looking forward to hearing his remarks. And again, thank him for his partnership with the businesses in the Commonwealth. So Ray, back to you, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And as always, thank you for your support. And we're very grateful and thankful for Kentucky American Water. Thanks, Ray. The global uh, coronavirus pandemic has created a year like no other in modern times, especially for businesses, but also for families. On March the 6th, after confirming the state's first case of COVID-19, Governor Bashir immediately declared a state of emergency to unlock more resources to help fight the virus and activate the Emergency Management Operations Center. Since March the 6th, the governor's actions have helped save thousands of lives and provide guidance to businesses, schools, and other organizations. It is a difficult task balancing the need to take steps to slow the spread of the coronavirus while keeping our economy moving in helping those who are hurt by economic fallout. As we head into month 10 of this crisis, unbelievably month 10, many in the business community are searching for certainty about what to expect in the weeks and months ahead. Governor Bashir, we appreciate the opportunity to hear from you today. After your opening remarks, I have some questions for you that were submitted by some of our members. I hope that we'll have time to answer those questions, time permitting, of course. Please proceed with your remarks, sir. And thank you again. Well, thank you, Ray. Good to see you and everybody else. Just thinking that last year we were all together. Uh, and I think I was standing behind your podium. And at this time, a year later, I think this podium is attached to my legs. So I've been behind this one uh, so much. But I want to extend my personal thanks to Bob Quick and his team for inviting me to speak with you today and for prioritizing everybody's health by conducting a safe virtual event. I look forward, and I know we all do, to the day when we can once again safely gather and enjoy that in-person fellowship missing from all of our lives. But as we fight COVID-19, we must continue to act together 
as Team Kentucky and each do our part to slow the spread of COVID and protect our people. Lexington has always been special to me and my family. I called Lexington my home for most of my youth, including my time at Henry Clay High School. It remains one of my favorite places to be, a place that I bring my family and visitors uh, alike. Now, it's not gonna come as a surprise to anyone watching or listening today. The challenges posed by this global health pandemic have been severe for all Kentucky families, for Lexington, for the Lexington business community. A promise I made after the first case we had on March the 6th, I can still remember it. I'd, it was a Friday, I'd left a little bit early, wanted to spend some time with my family on what was a beautiful March day. And I got the call that we had that first case, a patient being treated at UK Chandler Hospital. My promise from that day is I wasn't gonna play politics with this. This is a global pandemic and the virus doesn't care about whether we are a Democrat or Republican. Instead, this continues to be about life and death, and I'm always gonna make the necessary decisions to keep our people safe. Now, in this pandemic, there are no easy choices. Actions that we've had to take are unpopular, but inaction is deadly. So we have, in each wave of this virus, now on our third, targeted our steps based on the best available public health guidance for stopping what is now an uncontrolled spread of the virus. I think back in March, and there was so much that we didn't know. We didn't have the testing that we needed. We didn't have PPE for those that were in COVID wings helping people out. And we were seeing, we lost 20 individuals connected to one revival in Western Kentucky alone in that time period, a significant loss. And so at that time, we took what were some drastic uh, steps that were taken all over the country to give ourselves time to be prepared and to learn more. Our second wave, which we had in July, we knew so much more. We were so much more prepared and the steps that we could take were targeted and we got significant buy-in at that point, especially from the business community on enforcing a mask mandate. And in each of those ways, we stopped what appeared to be an exponential growth of this virus. But now we are in a third wave and the growth is larger, the number of cases more than we ever thought possible, at least after some of those initial models back in March. So I know the response to the coronavirus threat, including new restrictions aimed at stemming what is exponential growth in our positive cases and an increase in hospitalizations and ICUs and in ventilators. I know that places a significant burden on many of you and on so many of our families, uh, including mine. I have two kids that desperately wanna be in in-person classes that aren't. But when we strip away some of the, the noise, I know that the vast majority of you, the vast majority of all Kentuckians have been doing the right thing are doing the right things. And I want to continue to do the right things to protect your customers, your employees, and keep our economy on track to thrive as we emerge from this pandemic. One thing we know for sure after these many hard months is there can be no sustained economic recovery without an effective virus response. Every time and in every place where we have gotten a little lax, this virus, has exploded. That's just what it does. Every time that happens, we see another devastating spike in COVID cases and deaths, but also disruption to businesses. Facilities closed days for deep cleaning, whole production lines and shops shuttered by outbreaks. So let me say it plainly. Anyone suggesting we can fully revive our economy without controlling the virus is offering a false choice. So the new steps that we have taken are targeted. They are targeted to have the largest impact as we and many other states see uncontrolled spread of the virus that threatens to overextend our healthcare systems. Some of our hospitals are nearing capacity. They have record numbers of people in intensive care and on ventilators. Some have stopped certain elective procedures, which is almost a last step that they take. And every day as I look at the numbers, 
I don't just see the, the number of deaths and I actually see most of the names and hear a lot of the stories. But I see increases day after day in our healthcare system that are concerning. And I see more of our doctors and nurses being quarantined because of community spread, meaning there are fewer people there at that hospital to help us when we are sick. Some other states and some other cities have had to go much further than we have, but in Kentucky, we have proven capable of fighting this fight. We have stopped two previous waves and I'm committed to stopping this one. We just have two choices right now. We can surrender and accept fatalities or we can fight back. And when we fight back, it's tough, just like in any war and we are at war, there is difficulty. And some bear more of that difficulty and that sacrifice than others. And it's not fair, but it is necessary uh, to protect those around us and to ultimately ensure that we defeat this virus. And even when you adjust for population, when you look at what Kentucky has done thus far, you ought to be proud. It's difficult to be proud in the midst of a pandemic, but if you look at the lives we've lost in Kentucky versus virtually all of our surrounding states, you will see that despite uh, having worse health outcomes in general, despite being number one, two, or three in heart disease, lung cancer, and diabetes, that's who this virus comes for. We have had lower deaths per capita than in most of the rest of the United States and versus virtually all of our neighbors. That means we have done more and done better to protect each other and more people's families. We'll be here, especially next year, when we're able to truly get together. In all this, Lexington's business community re remains an indispensable partner. You care about your customers, workers, coworkers, colleagues, and the community. So thank you. Thank you for doing the right things. Thank you for following the guidance from us, from the White House, from the CDC, from Dr. Stack. And there is miraculous news on the vaccine front. We hope to have our first shipment in Kentucky just a little later this month. And if the effectiveness of the vaccines, the, the two that are out remain, and if we can get progress in the manufacturing and distribution from these companies, we can put this behind us. My hope is even in late spring, but certainly in early summer. And that's the, that's the timeline for almost all of it, we hope. Let me tell you what I think we can do in the next month and a half. We can hopefully vaccinate every nursing home or long-term care resident and staff. 66% of our deaths to date, it's about 1,200 people that have died have been in those nursing homes and facilities. And we have fought to keep it out. Uh, our veteran center in Wilmore, not too far from where you are right now, we didn't have our first case until the middle of October. And now we've lost over 30 veterans in that facility. So by prioritizing that group along with our frontline healthcare workers, we can cut the devastation of this virus, maybe even by the end of January. Think about what that'll mean. And then as we work out from there, those at special risk, our, our, our teachers, once that happens, oh, it allows for so much more uh, in our education community. There is a bright, bright light at the end of this tunnel. But we can't give up before we get there. I think when we look back on the history of this virus and our response in Kentucky, right now it'd be a positive story about how we came together. And even though we got tired at different places, we stuck with it, we protected one another, and then we were a model of how you respond to one of these. And it wasn't because of me, it was because of our families, our businesses, the choices that we all uh, made. But if we give up these last couple months, if we lose a lot more people in what could be a dark and a grim time than we have to, because we simply don't have the strength or the will to get to that vaccine, to buy us enough time to get it out there, that'll be the story that they write in Kentucky. Not on my watch. We're committed to fighting back and I know you are too. And we are so excited about these vaccines and what they can mean. Each of you are influential members of this community in this Commonwealth. And I urge you to reach out to our congressional delegation 
and implore them to help us to get through this pandemic. The biggest challenge we face right now, aside from getting folks to do the right thing and deploying this vaccine, which is a great problem to have and we are on top of it, is the fact that December 31st, every dollar that we receive to fight this virus dries up. Think about no testing, no contact tracing, no additional dollars for vaccine distribution, uh, no additional help to those on unemployment. And that's before we even get to what else is necessary, which is a robust stimulus package that helps so many of your businesses, small businesses, and individuals. I can tell you, looking forward to the next budget, that what was done this year and the way it cycled through our economy worked. It truly worked. And we can see in the data that if we can get that continued stimulus from the federal government, and I know people can debate a few things here and there, but if we can continue to do that, our recession will be short and our future very bright. And as we have a lot of great things going on on the economic development front, I believe at the end of this year, we're going to announce that uh, the jobs that we announced this year, which there are still a significant number, the projects that we announced this year have the second highest average wages in our state's history. So we're not just trying to bring jobs to the Commonwealth. We're trying to bring good jobs to the Commonwealth. But to keep that going, to make sure that we don't limp out of COVID, we run into our future, I really need your help. We need Congress to act. Right now, what we're seeing is basic negligence of not even getting testing, funding, and, and, and others passed. And I keep seeing, and I won't, I won't cast aspersions on either party or group, I keep seeing letters from the different ones and half of them are just attacking the other party or their leaders. That's just not gonna get us where we need to go during this pandemic. It's time to be statesmen and women, or how about just human beings? Human beings that realize where we are and what it's gonna take to get through. So please, I know that you all have the ears, uh, whether it's Senator McConnell, Senator Paul, or any of our uh, Congress uh, men, please reach out to them. And while I know it's not enough, we're trying to do what we can to help individuals and, and businesses. We provided an eviction relief fund, which actually worked uh, really well, and we're gonna see uh, if we can do more. We provided a utility assistance fund. Uh, there's still some real dollars uh, in that, and I know that there are utilities all over the state that could use uh, those dollars. Uh, we stepped up during the period where we could and, and provided a little additional unemployment, which I know helped people, especially in, in low-wage jobs. And we just recently launched the portal for the Food and Beverage Relief Fund yesterday. And I urge everybody who's eligible to apply. We've already received more than 2,000 applications with businesses requesting more than $19 million. I know that this pandemic is incredibly hard on restaurants and bars, um, but it's now a fact, and it's an unfortunate fact of this virus, that that is a primary place where it spreads. You can hear Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks talk about it. You can see it in the recommendations from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. You can read the studies from Northwestern or Stanford or the CDC. You can look at the, the, the cell phone data where they track where people have, have been um, before contracting the, the virus. And it's unfortunate that the virus has targeted uh, so many of, of these important businesses. It's our job to do what we can to help them get through it but also to take the necessary steps to where we don't allow this uncontrolled spread uh, to continue. So even as we fight COVID-19, we are focused on business retention, serving existing industries, and building our economy back stronger for a more prosperous 2021 and beyond. So, so far this year, our Cabinet for Economic Development has shepherded through 10 major Lexington projects, representing more than $25 million in investment, 160 jobs with good wages, and this is during a pandemic. Statewide, we're at about 184 projects, 6,800 full-time jobs, $2.2 billion, but we're not done. So one of those projects is the $11 million expansion of Summit Biosciences, Inc. out of the University of Kentucky's Cold Stream Research Campus. And like a lot of Lexington success stories, Commerce Lexington played a pivotal role in helping Summit Biosciences beginning all the way back in 2009. Today, Summit's investment tops $19 million, and they're gonna employ more than 75 people. Those are great jobs with high wages, 
that thanks to the work of many of you all, we've been able to increase even while fighting a worldwide health pandemic. In my administration, we're also doing our part by some more supporting community preparedness and entrepreneurship in Lexington. In September, Lexington received approval for a $500,000 product development initiative investment to help Coldstream, again, create and attract tech-oriented businesses. The investment's gonna build a new office and laboratory building on that Coldstream Research Campus, which is the gateway to the high-tech education corridor in the bluegrass. And we're gonna continue to work with you to find the solutions that we need, again, not just to get through what we're facing right now, but to build a brighter future. So many partners, uh, public, private, and in government have been a part of getting us from March 6th to today. And I know it's gonna take even more partnership as we move forward. And I think I say just about every day that we're gonna get through this and we're gonna get through this together. And the reason is because of you and everybody else out there that are working incredibly hard to make sure we take the right steps to protect one another, but to prepare for our future. And I will tell you, I think we have an incredibly bright future. One where we have more potential than maybe we even thought was possible in the past, because suddenly density, people looking at New York or Los Angeles, that's not nearly as attractive as it used to be. With the ability to do more remote work and knowing that's going to be a part of the future, it opens up more opportunities all across Kentucky. And our job is to be ready to grasp it. We are already at the forefront of some of the newest emerging industries like agritech, something that I know the University of Kentucky, Mayor Gordon, and many of you have been working on. Um, we haven't just had advancements in the Lexington area. This year, we opened the largest greenhouse in North America. It's one of the 10 largest buildings of the world in Moorhead and in App Harvest. Uh, and pro projects like App Harvest going on throughout the state all across uh, Kentucky. The chance to be where uh, some of the largest investors are centered is something that we haven't had the opportunity to do a lot. But you know, eyes are turning to Kentucky. They are seeing our perseverance. They're seeing how much we care about each other, and they are seeing our potential. It's our job to grasp it. So again, thank you very much for having me. And, and Ray, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Governor, um, for your remarks. I wanna thank you for your leadership. And uh, since March the 6th, I especially wanna thank you for pulling us all together as Team Kentucky. And we're very grateful and thankful for that. We have three, three distinct buckets uh, that most of our questions fall into that we would definitely wanna, while you have the time, hit on. Um, of course, schools, um, liability protections for businesses. And, and my first question is around businesses and what data are we using to make decisions? We've got this date of December the 13th uh, looming over a lot of the hospitality industry. And some of them are making very hard decisions about staying open or, or closing. And um, that group in particular would like to know what are some of the data points that we're using that they can be aware of, that they can pay attention to, and how can they help bring the attention to the additional supports that are needed uh, for the hospitality industry in particular? A couple uh, different areas that we're looking at. One, you can look at uh, total cases, and it's not that we need to stop them or, or, or start seeing them coming down, but what we do have to do is we have to reduce the growth of cases week after week. When you look at that stair stepper chart that we use, uh, the purple one in, in our four o'clocks, you can see an exponential growth of cases that has absolutely taken off. I think it took us seven months before we had our first day of a thousand cases. It took us another month and a half, two months to get to our first day with 2000 cases. It took us less than a week to go from 2000 to 3000 cases. So the exponential growth is the most severe we've seen. And basically we just have to start slowing down uh, that train. And once we have it slowed down, um, you know, our anticipation is December the 14th. We hope that um, uh, those facilities are back at, at their 50% capacity, but we have got to see better enforcement of the mask mandate. Now, I had calls, and it was both with retailers and, and restaurant groups, about it's really hard and people get upset. It, the mask mandate is what allows us at an indoor location to have a, a, a 
50% occupancy because this thing spreads where people come together and take their masks off. And at a restaurant, in hospitality, you're going to do that. But outside with people waiting, uh, before food comes and the rest, we really need um, better compliance with that. But I don't just want to single out that industry on the compliance side. This is also community spread. It's, it's so much community spread, even where we have people in full PPE, like our nursing homes, where we test them three times a week, it's still getting in because there is so much spread and that's based on our individual decisions and, and also enforcement on, that, on, the, on the masking front. We're also closely watching our hospitalizations, um, our ICU um, capacity, and, and in part, our, our ventilator capacity. Our ventilator capacity is, is, it's tragic the number of people on it, but we, we have a significant number of ventilators and we don't see being uh, overwhelmed uh, there. The problem is once you're on a ventilator, you're in a really tough place. So, so certainly um, slowing down the growth of cases and then looking at hospitalizations and, and ICU. Uh, now, with the steps that we took and doing it all at once and asking for and trying to treat everybody in those groups the same and asking for that three weeks, our, our goal is to have the maximum impact that we can on the virus. And that gives us much more hope of, of being able to uh, get back to where we were before we had to put these new steps in place. And that's still what we anticipate. Next question, Governor, is a, is a school and workforce question. Um, interestingly enough, you, Dr. Fauci and a lot of experts have talked a lot about restaurants and bars. Uh, at the same time, the CDC and Dr. Fauci and others have said that schools are safe to reopen. And our larger business community in particular would like to have some guidance when it comes to healthy at school. In other words, healthy at school guidelines seem to be working um, at the time. Um, and they allowed for student quarantine when necessary. Um, what is, there's a lot of conversation about getting back to school across the country come January the 4th, with especially Kentucky being one of the few states uh, with New York and California talking about significantly getting back online and getting back to school be one of the few states that are all the way across the board out of school at this point. Can you give us some information or your thoughts about getting back to school, especially from a workforce perspective? It's really impacted the mental health of our kids. We understand that and the, and the learning loss, but it's also become a workforce issue, sir. Well, Ray, it's impacting me and my family too. I have a 10 and an 11 year old and I see every day uh, how in-person learning is far superior to what they're going through. But the steps we took were necessary for a couple of reasons. First, it's hard to say that what we were doing was working when about 80% of our state had voluntarily gone virtual before we put out the order it, itself. Second, we had 10,000 students required to be quarantined in just the two weeks beforehand. It was a significant growth and it was picking up each week as it went. And there are emotional difficulties with quarantine. I've been through them uh, with my family and, and there's um, some emotional harm, of course, that happens to our kids uh, when they test positive and we were seeing a significant increase there. Second thing we were seeing is just like in long-term care facilities and especially coming out of the Thanksgiving holiday schools, we believe we're all ready, but we're going to be overwhelmed. So if, if the veterans home in Wilmore that tests every employee three times a week and whereas full PPE can't keep it out of their facility, how's a school that doesn't conduct testing at all? And, and that's something we hope that we can do in the future, uh, do the same. Uh, we were seeing uh, very concerning signs. And again, if we don't wanna do these stop and start on restrictions, we had to throw the hardest punch we can uh, at this virus to get in the place for uh, January the 4th, where our expectation is although probably in a hybrid model, uh, we hope, um, especially our elementary schools, if not the others are, are back in session. And obviously capacity is an issue. I think all of us can agree that, you know, I went to Henry Clay, we can't have 2000 uh, kids at the, at the same time uh, in that building, which hadn't changed much uh, since, since I was there. But we are, we are working really hard on the school front. Now on the CDC guidance and others, it's really important to look at the details in it because they all talk about how community spread can grow so large 
uh, that it, it all of a sudden is, is no longer uh, safe. Uh, that was in the uh, original guidance. It is still in the guidance that's out there. And the incident rate map that we use that shows what's red and what's orange and, and what's yellow, they created. You know, that was the CDC's tool where that 25 uh, number uh, was, was where they said it's, it's no longer safe in, in the community. Uh, for our schools to be safe, for our teachers, our educators, and our kids to, to be safe, uh, we've got to reduce this virus, and that's what I think this is going to allow us to do. Okay, so schools should plan accordingly. In other words, look at hybrid models and how to lessen populations in schools. Right. We're, uh, we're going to be we're still up in the air about what happens come January the 4th. Oh, I expect January 4th in some form or fashion, uh, we will be back to uh, in class instruction. Uh, it, it's going to have to look a little bit different. Uh, but again, that's that's January 4th. Uh, let's let's talk about this vaccine and how it's getting out. You know, teachers are really in the top four categories of, of who and, and when gets the vaccine. And once we're able to deploy that vaccine to our educators, it all changes. Uh, school goes from from being something that that again we we are we are carefully watching to to being um, really safe, and and so our job is to deploy that vaccine as quickly as possible, knowing school's going to look a little different in January, but hopefully February March uh, can 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 look a lot more normal. I certainly hope for that. We, we're all very hopeful for it, and thank you for that, Governor. One one more good question, Governor. That was. Liability protection specific to COVID-19 are a major concern for many of our business community. What, if any, effort can, the, can you make to advance COVID liability protection for businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations that took responsible precautions uh, while, while reopening to the public? And do you plan to support liability protection legislation in this next upcoming General Assembly? Well, I want to see uh, what that legislation looks like, but I think your question had uh, that important piece in it. For those that did it right and continue to do it right, who follow the guidelines that are out there, it's something that we absolutely have to look at. And if you're doing all that and COVID still gets in, I get it. I mean, I'm fighting this every day. At some point, you can get overwhelmed because of the community uh, around you. Uh, one of your major employers in the area, I remember talking to and, and saying, you know, we've got these great uh, uh, efforts that are being done in, in our facility, and they're a very major employer. But it's what our people do when they leave uh, the, the facility. And, and that is a, a real challenge. So I am, I am certainly open um, to, to uh, types of protections for those that have worked really hard on it or, or, or worked on it. Now, one area that I do have concern is we know that while everybody who's there today or, or on this today has done it right, you can all point to four or five competitors or other businesses or places that you walk into for stuff. And you see a sign on the front that said, if you're wearing a mask, don't come in here. That's a little different, right? If you've subjected your employees day after day, knowingly to that type of harm, well, there's some repercussions there. Uh, but I certainly think those that are, that are trying really hard, if COVID's gotten in, it's out of no fault of, of your own. So that's, that's something we're definitely going to be reasonable and have those discussions on. Do you have time for another question? We have a question on unemployment. Sure. Uh, we just want to ask you this on the record. Um, business is also, of course, concerned about unemployment insurance system and uh, the outstanding number of claims and the lack of funding in the trust fund and the possibility of tax increases next year uh, to decrease that fund. Can you give us an update on both those issues and situations? Well, on the second piece, we've committed at least $200 million of CARES Act fund. I actually think it's going to be larger than that because it's 200 million plus anything we have left because we have to spend it by December 31st. And that's going to significantly pay down uh, the loan that's out there. We've been working with the chamber and Ashley on that. I think they agree that this is a, a really good size payment. I think more than they anticipated, but we were always looking towards that. We just had to leave ourselves enough wiggle room if, if the testing prices went through the roof that we were still able to provide the, the COVID tests and, and other responses that, that we have to have on this. Um, I, I believe that the, the, the unemployment situation 
uh, is is getting better. There is a, a significant backlog. You know, our challenge is that we 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 get through a month, and then there's another month of people uh, that are filing. But but generally, um, we see the oldest claims primarily down to waiting for additional more information from uh, the individual from a dispute uh, employer and employee waiting on out of state information. Uh, now it's that. Admittedly, it's that second level, that that appeal that you can file, uh, that that is taking uh, more and and significant time, and it's a challenge. But it, it it also ought to teach us a lesson coming out of this. That in good times, uh, we can't dismantle, and whether that's through inadequate funding, inadequate people, or inadequate IT systems, the the uh, the important safety nets that we would need if something like this happens, and how quickly it happened. We're working on an IT system that was created in the year 2000 uh, that is incredibly hard to operate and we should have replaced a long time ago. We will be able to fully replace it this next year. We've put in $6 million of CARES Act money to improve it, uh, but until recently, it was even hard to search for what claim is the oldest by filing date. It is system uh, that out of date. The other thing is about three years ago, two and a half, uh, we cut our unemployment staff by 90 people. That was in a, in a budget where times were better, but that's when we need to make sure that we have a sufficient number of people there. And, and unemployment is wieldy. There are so many federal regulations and state that the training time is really significant in ramping people up. And what that created along with a record number of claims is a situation where, where the state didn't come in being prepared for something of this magnitude or probably even half of this magnitude. So we're trying to rebuild this plane uh, while we're flying it. Uh, we do believe we are seeing improvement. Uh, we're at a point now where we, we just got to get through every day and get through and, and get through them at a time when what the federal government tells us continues to change uh, day in and, and day out. Now there is, um, uh, I believe today, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators that put forth a proposal that would provide significant additional unemployment help uh, to states. I think that that may be in processing, which we're hearing from, from the federal government. It may be in some automatic uh, approvals, but it also appears to be in direct dollars that would uh, significantly help us with what we've had to borrow. Some of the numbers I saw, if they held up, we might be able to repay the, the, the full amount of, of the loan. But we're gonna get the loan down. Um, I, I believe it's going to be ultimately manageable, and we've talked with uh, certainly the state chamber about being willing to work on legislation during this session, because the date we're going to be able to put this extra money in is after when they calculate that tax rate to, to in the very least, reduce it to the amount it would be if we'd been able to put that money in at the calculation date. Okay. Well, thank you for the... Uh... Q&A, Governor, we appreciate your time. Uh, we know you're working on a lot of things. Um, and we, we just really appreciate this opportunity to interact with you. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Kentucky American Water and Nick Rowe uh, and all the sponsors for supporting this series. Um, please support these sponsoring businesses who have impacted so many people and organizations through our community. We wanna thank uh, Nick again, we wanna thank the Governor again uh, and if Commerce Lexington can be of any assistance to you, please do not hesitate to reach out to the team. Uh, 